Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Outliers YouTube channel and our program, Get to Know. I'm your host, D.P. Lyle, and I'm here with my partner in crime. She's actually not in jail today, which is a miracle, <laughs> Kathleen Antrim. Thanks, Doug. <laughs> Thanks for the announcement. Yes, I'm free, and there was no bail. Um, so today, we have a fantastic interview for you. We've got a best-selling um, author. Her name is Tammy Uliano. And she writes medical thrillers. So Tammy, I always like to start off the interviews with a question about your childhood. I'd like to know if there's anything about your childhood that you think made you predisposed to become a writer. And what kind of child were you? What was your childhood like? Were you an introvert, an extrovert? Did you read a lot? Share with us. I was definitely a nerd and uh, fairly introverted and always reading. Um, and so I think most writers, that's true, that they wrote the silly little stories you write in kindergarten. In fact, my mom was cleaning out her attic and gave me a box of my childhood mementos. And there was a, you remember the paper with the two lines and then the little dotted line in the middle? Oh, yeah, the yeah. <laughs> I had a really lovely story about a lion and a butterfly. It made absolutely no sense, but it was it was very cute. Um, so I, but you got your uppercase and lowercase letters I, right. Yeah. In cursive. I did. I did. Yeah. And that was a precursor to my um, not great handwriting in, uh, in my other career, of course. Exactly. <laughs> um, so I loved reading. We did the, um, our library had a huge supply of biographies. And for some reason, I just got really interested in reading biographies. They were, you know, written for children. They weren't biographies of, like today, where there are 500 pages. Um, and I read all the Nancy Drews and the Encyclopedia Browns, so I really enjoyed the mysteries. Um, I didn't really think about writing a mystery until many years later, um, but as a child, there were several of us who were best friends, and, and we would basically compete for who could read the most books in a week, and so that would, wow. that contributed to much much nerding out on the couch on our velvet, you know, fake velvet white oh, yes. 1970s <laughs> couch. Was it green or orange? Oh, ours was white. Believe it oh, or not, it was white. white. Wow, wow, your parents so we were brave. Mirror over it, you know, with the mirror and the one yeah. side of the lights. Yeah, it was. It was very seventies. <laughs> so you your got sidetracked from the literary world by the medical field. How did How did you end up there? And 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 what was your training? And, and what do you What do you do now in that arena? I was um, a, a typical nerd, sort of what's the most difficult thing I can do just to show I can do it. And uh, and medicine was that. So I um, I went to college actually planning to be a medical researcher. So I started out in engineering and I was going to do something great with medical research with engineering and then ended up deciding that I really didn't like killing rats and, and doing that sort of stuff. <laughs> so I so I stuck with medicine then I decided I didn't want to do medicine and I went back to engineering and sort of combined the two. And that's how I ended up in anesthesia because there's so much physiology to it. So I got involved with the human simulator project. So this is back in the late eighties, early nineties. Um, oh, wow. University of Florida and, and Stanford were the two places where they developed full scale human patient simulators. So that was my, the thing that kept me in medical school was uh, that I was very fortunate to get the opportunity to work on that project. And then my fellowship, I spent um, basically making this very masculine human simulator into a very unattractive pregnant woman for <laughs> for uh, the physiology of pregnancy so that we could practice handling emergencies that happen in, in the obstetric community. So that's kind of where I made my name in at least my first part of my career in medicine. So when did you decide to start writing? I... Always, you know, when I would read textbooks, I, I had told my chairman that I'd really like to be on the spine of one of those one day. And he he thought that was a good goal. You know, I'd written book chapters and things. And then I I went to actually his father, this 80-year-old German amazing person whose biography I do want to write someday, um, and told him that there was no good medical school book for anesthesia. Uh, you know, every medical student in most places does a, a couple weeks rotation in anesthesia and most other specialties have a textbook for them and anesthesia didn't. And so he said, well, let's write one. So he and I sat down and over about a two year period, we wrote an introductory textbook with humor and fun stuff for, for medical students and, and we finished it. And it was just such a 
a pleasure and a privilege to work with this man. He would tell me all these stories about he was in World War II as a medic. He wow. put himself through medical school in Germany immediately after World War II, just all these really great stories. And he said, what are we going to write next? And I, uh, and he said, how about a mystery? <laughs> wow, what a great idea. So we started writing a mystery together. And um, unfortunately, he fell ill and passed away. But I, that gave me the bug. So that's where I got started. Oh, my gosh. So did that end up becoming your first book or? It didn't. I, I Someday I'll go back to that one. But pieces of it ended up in Fatal Intent. Wow. So what's your process? Do you outline? Are you a pantser? How do you? I would really like to know. Do you have any advice? <laughs> <laughs> Every book has been completely different. When I first started writing with him, I sat down and I said, I read a lot, I'll just write a book. And I started writing and I had like a POV from the cat and you know, it was, and I went, wow, I really don't know anything about writing fiction. It had nothing to do with writing a textbook or writing journal articles. So I thought I'd go on Amazon and just get the, whatever the highest rated book on writing, there's probably 10, I'll just get the highest one. Well, you know, there's thousands and thousands. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I got one by K.M. Wayland on plotting a novel. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so for my first novel, which I already knew what I wanted to write, I used that and I just went literally line by line. I did it exactly the way she told me to and plotted the whole thing out. Yeah, and it worked out okay. And that turned into Fatal Intent. And then there was another book I wanted to write and I didn't plot it. And I started it on NaNoWriMo and I just said, I'm just going to write. And oh my gosh, that thing was a hot mess. So I said, I must be a plotter. <laughs> and now over the next three or four books, now I'm sort of an, an, a, a planter, an in-between. I don't know if you can see behind me, there's that enormous whiteboard. Oh yeah, yeah. So I'll do some mind mapping. And then, yeah. um, then I, you know, I use all sorts of different advice from different books and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. But right now I'm trying the, um, the, I guess like the shitty first draft, but, um, but we're <laughs> calling it the throwaway um, where I just start writing and see where it goes. I've got uh, the tent poles basically of where I want to go. And I'm trying sure. to just write in between and leave out the, you know, something big happens here, sort of, you know, here I'm going to describe an office and skip all that stuff. Um, Cause that worked fairly well for me on the last one. And, uh, and then we'll see. So, so it's still evolving. That's so cool. Yeah. Um, and obviously you write medical thrillers and as an MD, um, I would assume that really comes in handy, obviously, as far as background and that kind of thing. Do you think you'll ever depart from that or have you found your niche? I, I would love to write other things. So the first two books um, were a series of medical thrillers. Another book I wrote is has a little bit of medicine to it, but it's more about this idea in my head that was, what if the world was infertile and someone came up with the cure for fertility, but it required a treatment? And then who gets to decide who gets to have the treatment? And I just found that fascinating. And the idea of a world where every child is planned instead of planning not to have kids, oh, yeah. you have to consciously say, I want to have a kid, I'm gonna take this pill and who should regulate that or should there be right? And I really like the sort of ethically murky mm -hmm. and then picking somebody who's a, a, a laudable character on, on all the different sides of the argument to make a, a cogent argument that makes sense instead of it mm -hmm. being, trying to make things black and white. I think it's more fun to make it all gray. And yeah. So, so I love that book, but I made the beginning of it be from a viral pandemic. <laughs> and of course, I wrote it before COVID, but now people are going, ah, no, not interested. Um, so that one has not gone anywhere, but it's less medical. My current novel that's being um, sent out by my agent is, um, is a dual timeline with a medical angle, but it's not the same as my medical thrillers. It's more mystery. Mm -hmm. um, Tell us about that. It's, I think it's really fun. It's based on the theory that the Salem witch trials were due to ergot poisoning of the rye crop. Oh. And so my 1692 timeline is, is that time when those things are happening and it's a, a physician at that time. And then his 12th descendant grandson in modern times who still lives in his same house and is um, 
about to start medical school and now these symptoms are recurring and he's trying to figure out why and nobody believes him because that's such a, as we call it in medicine, such a zebra diagnosis that nobody wants to listen to him, even though he's got his great, 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 great grandfather's journals. And he says, this is the same thing. So, so it was just really fun to research 16th century medicine in the oh, U S yeah. and um, I got well, to go a to lot going on there. There's a lot going on there. There is, and, you know, that the, both the medical, the psychological, the historical, I mean, there's a lot going on there. And I like that concept. That's, that's very, it was, clever. it was very fun. So my agent wants me to write a sequel to that, to, to have ready. And so I'm trying to decide how to do that, but, but yeah, it's, um, so it's a little bit of a departure for me, but one of my mentors in medical school was the president of the Wood Library, which is a medical history library. So he's been really helpful um and always had me interested in history well i find with a lot of, cool. of, of scientists that when you start writing fiction it's a different animal than anything you've done before like you alluded to earlier and we as physicians think very linearly and 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 it, it's it's got to be clean you got to come to the right decision at the right time sometimes very quickly but the evidence has to be brought in and you got to solve the problem. And I know you're big on problem on solving problems and puzzles and stuff. Um, but fiction is messy. So how do you get your doctor hat out of the way and put on your storytelling hat to make all the stuff, a viable story that people want to read? It's definitely been part of my learning curve. My first edition of, uh, or my first version of, of Fatal Intent was way too um, obvious what was going on, way too many clues um, that were put together and, and not enough uh, of that storytelling part. So a lot of that is just reading, reading, reading. I'm in some critique groups and seeing how they do it um, has been amazing. Um, but yeah, that's, it's yeah. still part of my learning curve, but I do yeah. love stories and you know, storytelling is how we communicate anything. Anything memorable Everything. comes mm -hmm. much more through story than it does through me reciting facts. So the majority of my teaching is is telling residents about an actual case, not yes. just rattling off the facts of how to deal with something. It's way more memorable that way. Absolutely. Well, I find it interesting that obviously through your entire life, you have challenged yourself to do things that are incredibly difficult just to prove you could do it. And... Personally, I feel novel writing's no different. Um, have you found it very challenging? Oh, absolutely. It was incredibly humbling to go from, you know, I had made professor, I was sort of at the pinnacle of my career and mm -hmm. sort of on the track to become chairman. I was the program director. And all of a sudden I decided to start writing and I was learning from people half my age. And, and it's incredibly humbling to go, you know what? I don't know anything about this world and I have to start at the bottom and not expect to yes. start, you know, somewhere in the upper third where you've, where you've lived most of your career, but it's also been amazing for your brain and your, mm -hmm. uh, and just writers are just such amazing people. And, don't tell my physician friends, but you know, you go to an anesthesia conference and everybody's, <laughs> my research is more important than your research kind of exactly. stuff. Exactly, cardiology is the same way, yeah. And everybody <laughs> is writing, oh, no, that's no, no. so cool. I, I love reading those kinds of things. Have you thought about, you know, it's all collaborative, you know, the the whole raising the whole mm -hmm. the whole ocean instead of trying to to be yep. the one candle in the room. So, so I just, I just I love like the whole I environment. I like that metaphor candle in the room. You know, you, you mentioned yeah. reading, 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 and I always tell writers that I said, look, learning medicine is an apprenticeship. You hang around with people smarter than you, more experienced than you, and you sponge up everything you can from them. And then guess what? Pretty soon you know how to do it and you got to turn around and pass it on to the next generation. And so it's an apprenticeship. And whether you're the apprentice or the mentor, it's still an apprenticeship. Writing's the same way, except your 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 mentor are the books that are out there. That's right. Yeah, you, know, you can read all the books on writing you want, but read novels and you will learn how to write and a novel. Study them, yeah. Study how they did it. Yeah. And that's the hard part because I get I am like the ultimate reader in that I am, you know, willful suspension of disbelief. I'm completely oh. in the story and I actually have to go, wait, I want to remember how they and I have to go back and read it again. Yes. I have yep. Highlights and all sorts of stuff in books that just, you know, phrases that I go, wow, that's just 
it becomes transparent to me when I'm reading. So I have to, I have to go back. Well, when you become a writer, I think that you kind of kill half the fun of reading. <laughs> the truth well, you do. You I do have, have much fun with less the story, tolerance. but it's a textbook too. I have and much movies. less tolerance for poor writing now. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's hard. And it's so amusing to me, you know, it, writing is very humbling, but it's amusing to me because so many people who think they can write an email so that they think they can write a book. And I'm like, not exactly the same thing, but anyway. <laughs> oh, right. Or they ask chat GPT to write it for them and feel like that's quality. Yeah. If you knew then what you know now about what you were going to have to go through and all the things you were going to have to learn to get to where you're at, would you still do it? hundred yeah. percent. Yes. Yes. Uh, one of my mentors said that every 10 years you should reinvent yourself and I like that do something different. And, and, and that's what I teach when I give talks about pivoting your career. Cause now I'm sort of an expert on that. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, I loved medicine. I loved teaching medical students. I got tired of it. So I started being an administrator. Boy, I got tired of that quick. Um, and then I started writing and and I absolutely love it. And now I'm sort of expanding into doing a little more teaching of writing. Um, and then I, I don't know what I'll do next, but I, I don't think it'll be without writing because it's it just, it gets into your soul. And, and, you know, if anybody had told me, well, people did tell me and I thought they were cuckoo, um, that your characters would be like talking to you and saying, I wouldn't do that. I would do it this way. And you're like, no, you're in my head. You do what I tell you to do. And <laughs> it's just such an incredible feeling when, when the thing on the page is not what you plan to put there. Exactly. Yeah. Yet it's so much better than what you plan to put there. Yeah. Well, when they Steve, take Stephen, over. King, Stephen King has a great quote. I don't remember it verbatim right now, but he talks about how the characters and the situation tell him what's going to happen and how it's going to unfold. And he said, you have to learn that you're a secretary, not God, <laughs> that you're writing down what you're Love being told that. to write down. And yeah. that is so true. And that's the joy of it. I agree. I'm a panster myself. I just start and see where it goes. I like that. Yeah, I've I've not experienced that as much, but I'm starting to. And it's it's really, you know, that flow that Chick sent mm. me on. When you get in that flow, it's just, yeah. it's, it's just wonderful. And I've that's had the best. A, yeah. a great time with people that I've, I am very blessed to have a place that I can bring people to do writing retreats. And, uh, and we just have such a great time just hanging out together, writing and then playing games and doing whatever, but just being around writers. Oh, yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Writers are really cool people. Most have had other careers and have done fascinating, amazing things like yourself. And, uh, you know, you end up in a room with people that from all different walks of life and you learn so much even in that. Yeah. yeah, and that's why at writers' conference, the most important part is at the bar. Yeah, because people sit around and talk writing, talk story, talk about what other people are doing, get inspiration, get ideas, kick stuff around, and it, you know, and it's very informal. But you get a bunch of writers together, and some odd stuff comes out, <laughs> yes. and that's that's beautiful. That's yeah. Beautiful. yeah, yeah. Very cool. Very, very cool. Well, Tammy, it's wonderful to have had you on. You are a great interview. We're going to have to have you back. Let us know um, where people can buy your books. Uh, my website, tuliano.com, has links to all the bookstores and, of course, Amazon and, and hopefully uh, Poison Legacy, which who knows whether that'll still be the title, will we'll be there sometime soon. Well, we'll be looking for it. We definitely need to have you on when that one's coming out. Um, absolutely. Great. Yeah, absolutely. That would be really fun. Um, I also want to ask our listeners to please click the thumbs up. It helps with the algorithm, helps get the interviews out. If you like what we're doing here, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. And Tammy Giuliani, Giuliano, correct? Did I say that correctly? Giuliano. Um, look forward to having you back. You're fantastic. Doug, Thank back you. to you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. This Fun. has been fantastic. And we will do this again. So uh, everybody go to, to Tammy's website, buy her books, and mm -hmm. uh, you'll enjoy them. And we will rock and roll again. As you know, uh, this is the Outliers YouTube channel. This is our program, Get to Know. And we will be back with other interviews before too long. Sign up for our newsletter. It's on the website. And we will keep you informed of everything that's going on at Outliers, which right now is a lot. So a until lot. next time.